I said, I'm talking about angina, so I'm very, very, um, I'm going to be very precise. Talking about things we need to know for the AKT with regards to angina. I think we all know what angina is. Angina is just a chest pain um, as a result of insufficient blood supply to the myocardium. Um, it's usually caused by narrowing of the blood vessels that supplies the heart. And there are several things that might cause narrowing of the blood vessels to the heart. Um, we have two major types of angina, which is the stable and the unstable angina. Um, stable angina is angina that usually occurs uh, with uh, physical exertion, and the unstable occurs with just minimal physical exertion and, and at rest as well. So these are some of the risk factors that could cause narrowing of the blood vessels that supply the heart. Uh, we all have, know uh, we have the coronary artery disease, which are the most common causes, uh, common, common risk factors, sorry. We have um, age, um, the older you are, the more likely that your your, 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 your vessels are going to be narrowed. Um, somehow we say that males tend to have um, a likelihood about having more narrowed vessels than um, females. Ethnicity, usually the Asians, are most at risk of um, um, angina and narrowing of the blood vessels as well. It is the family history of um, of angina. You have um, a likely chance of having those as well. Smoking is also one of the major risk factors, and they have some medical conditions like this this lipidemia, which is usually the non HDL um, um, high non not high non um, HDL. Um, you have the hypertension, DM, CKD, rheumatoid arthritis, some severe mental health disorders as well. Uh, obesity, valvular heart disease, whole common hypertension are also risk factors. So these are triggers of angina. So angina can be triggered by physical activities, and it depends on the level of physical activity, it differentiates it from stable and unstable. Emotional stress sometimes triggers angina as well, and hot and cold, mostly with prince mental angina. So we're just jumping straight to the management of angina. So we manage the angina, a patient comes to you with complaint of chest pain, for example, and you suspect the patient has angina. The first thing you want to advise is lifestyle modifications to mitigate the cardiovascular risks. So cardiovascular risks like um, that, uh, uh, things that can increase cardiovascular risks like smoking, for example, um, telling the patient to increase level of physical activity to, to the point they could tolerate because they do have chest pain and um, diet modification as well is actually very helpful with advice sometimes alcohol and drinking um, um, alcohol to the normal limits to the required limits is also very uh, it's also good to be advised um, it's also good to advise the patient regards to that um, we have um, the gtn spray which is usually used for rapid rapid relief if a patient presents to use angina Trying of a GTN spray and that helps, kind of tells you that this might this is angina that you're dealing with, and this GTN spray is given um, every five minutes um, until you get um, symptomatic relief, and if not, you advise the patient to go into the hospital. Um, for symptomatic control, there are two first line treatments: it's either or. So either I give you a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker which can be the long-acting, the hydro or the rate-limiting ones. Um, while on a beta blocker, you have to maximize the dose of a beta blocker before you change, before you add um, a calcium channel blocker if symptoms are not completely resolved. And if the patient is on two maximum, doses of either a beta blocker and of both beta blocker and the calcium channel blocker um, and the symptoms still persist you might need to refer the patient to secondary care but before referring the patient to secondary care you could start one of the second line um, treatment for the patient which is the long acting nitrates um the corandrio evabradine or ranolaxine you can start that while the patients are waiting to be reviewed for a coronary angiography. So 
like I said, it's important to maximize the dose of dual therapy. If the patient is on maximum dose of dual therapy, you need to refer before you start the second line of um, treatment. And it's also good to note that while the patient is on beta blockers, you can't give weight limiting beta blockers, which are the diatasms and the verapamil, and because it cause severe bradycardia and subsequently lead to heart failure. And you also need to note that while starting in the patient on the second lines, which are the um, long acting nitrates and um, the nicoronadios and all and, and the others, you need to be ensure that the patient heart rate is seventy or above. So one more thing you need to do while managing the patient with angina is that you need to um, give medications to um, to uh, medications for prevention of cardiovascular risk, if needed. So aspirin is actually very, very recommended for patients with angina. You can calculate the cubics for the patient as well and start the patient on the starting, if recommended. If the patient has some comorbidities associated with these angina, you can give the patient some ACE inhibitors. Those also go on to help the patient from having frequent attacks and progression to having complications of the disease. But these are some points we need to know when we need to refer patients that present to the angina. So if a patient presents with angina and the pain is at rest or minimization, you need to refer to cardiology. If the patient has a rapidly progressive angina, despite increasing treatment, you need to refer. If this patient is having chest pain and has had the previous MI before in the past, or had a cabbage or a PCI in the past, you need to as well refer to the to the to the cardiologist. If a patient presents to you for the first time with chest pain and there's a form of abnormal ECG findings, you need to refer. If the patient comes with newly diagnosed angina together at, with AF, you need to refer. If a patient seems to be in heart failure and complain of chest pain as well, and angina symptoms, you need to refer. If you have tonosis and angina as well, you need to refer. And if you have any doubts in diagnosis, you need to refer the patient to secondary care. There are some few pointers I jotted down to gas to angina and lifestyle. Okay, one has to do with DVLA. So with DVLA, a patient with chest pain, angina with DVLA, if it's well controlled, the patient can drive. If the patient is having pain at rest, you might need to you might need to um, advise the advice that the patient needs the uh, symptoms to be controlled before they can drive. Um, for those patients, I don't think they need to inform the DVLA. With regards to um, air travel, uh, if the patient has a minimal, if the patient is, angina is well controlled, the patient can fly. If the patient has um, angina and with minimal exertion, the patient needs to fly with some things put in place, like someone, um, like oxygen masks and some assistance to fly to fly with. If the patient is having chest pain at rest, that patient does, is advised not to fly. And when it comes to sexual intercourse, it's okay for someone with vagina to be involved. And if having chest pain while having sex, they can have the GTN spray. But if the patient is on any of the long acting nitrates or the current deal, these patients can't have the GTN spray with these medications, but there are some exceptions if you need to give, which is a very important point. I don't know if this is something that might come in the exam, but I saw it and I felt like if, I'm a, if I was an examiner, I might put it out there. So when you're using a nitrate, and for example, um, sorry, um, if what I was trying to say is if a patient is taking any sildenafil or those drug um, enhancing um, drugs for erection and on the nitrates, it's actually contraindicated. So if the patient is on a GTN spray while having sex and is on, for example, on the coradil or a nitrates, um, um, one of those um, uh, uh, long acting nitrates, patient is advised not to use a GTN spray. Um, if the patient is on taking sildenafil, for example, 
and um, the patient needs to use the GTN spray. The patient is advised not to, but there are some exceptions. Um, so if the patient is taking sildenafil, um, the patient, I'm trying, I'm, I'm mixing something up. If the patient is taking sildenafil, the patient cannot take the long acting nitrates or the nucleurandils, but there are some exceptions to that. So there are some different types of 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 uh, of stimulants for erection. You have the avanafil, you have the sildenafil and tadanafil. So if it's necessary to give those two medications together, um, the nitrates and the sildenafil, for example, you have to give them. You have to space them apart. So for avanafil, you have to give them twelve hours apart if you're giving the nitrate and avanafil. If it's for sildenafil, it has to be 24 hours apart. And if it's for tadanafil, it has to be 48 hours apart when it comes to uh, um, um, sex and, uh, and angina as well. So I think that's all I have to say for angina. If you have any questions, you could ask.